today I'm driving a car which according to urban legend was designed by engineers working out of hours on a secret project and was made famous by James Bond. Is it a Golf GTI? Is it an Aston Martin? No, it's a BMW Z3. Okay, so out of hours and secret does make it sound a bit more A-team than it actually was, but it was put together by a team of people from BMW who were pulled away from their original intended tasks. The team was led by Birkens Goschel, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and the styling came from the Japanese designer Joji Nakashima, I think I said that right as well. Now Nakashima had been with BMW since 1988. He was also responsible for the E36 3 Series, the E39 5 Series and the E90 3 Series, and this was obviously a natural progression for him. BMW realised that the target market for this was absolutely going to be America, so this is very much a Japanese man's idea of the American Dream version of a British Roadster from the 60s. In fact, it's even the same length as the original MGB. As well as sharing the dimensions of an MGB, this also has the classic sports car proportions. Long bonnet, short cabin, tiny overhang over the rear wheels giving it that real, real classic it's a sports car from Britain look, even though this was really an American car from a German company designed by a Japanese man. I may have mentioned that already. At the time, it was criticised for being too retro looking, styled after sort of 40s, 50s cars and the first uh, BMW sports cars that came after the Second World War. This project started in 1991 and the styling was signed off in 1993, which is about well, seven or eight years before the retro thing really kicked off in a big way with the Mini in 2001 and the Fiat 500 not long after when suddenly retro was the biggest thing in the world and the Ford Thunderbird was what 97, 98? I have no idea why I said a number because people are going to pick me up in the comments I'm just trying to think off the top of my head right now. I'll google that and put it in the thing below. In a post-retro wave world, this has really stood the test of time quite well. Um, some cars look a bit pastiche, some look a bit like Thunderbird, for example, does look a bit silly now when you look at the, that version from the late 90s. This just looks understated, it looks kind of cool. It's just the mark of good design. Fashions fade, but style remains. And this, I've come to think, is quite stylish. Right, let's get inside and take it for a drive. Love that noise. Possibly the most iconic thing about a BMW from the 90s is the sound of that straight six engine, the M52. Oh, I love that. I'm gonna put the windows up. Oh. Electric windows down by the gear shift, a real BMW throwback. If ever you've owned an E30, you've probably found that your window switches have stopped working because junk has fallen in there and gone gooey and stopped them. So I'm rather hoping you can hear me clearly. Roof is down, obviously, it's a convertible, and that is the law. Whether you like it or not, if you're in a soft top, the roof goes down. I've just noticed my camera mount is a little bit wobbly, and it's shaking a bit. The suspension is quite stiff in this car. It's not rocking and shaking, it's just, I promise you, it's just the camera mount, which needs to be updated. Other, other exciting nerd news, I'm using a radio microphone today for the first time on this show. The uh, extensive wealth that this channel has garnered me has meant I can now spring for a hundred pound microphone after working for a year. That is my entire profit gone for the year though. This car is currently for sale in Stone Cold Classics. Thanks again to the guys there for loaning me the car to take this little review. I have to say for the point of objectivity, this is not a sponsored video. They lend me the car, I get to drive it. There's the payoff. Now I have to admit, when this car first came out, I wasn't a huge fan. It was before retro was a, a thing in terms of car design. It just looked a bit weird to me. And I didn't really get it. But now looking back, the design has aged so beautifully. It's mellowed like a fine wine and other cliches. Oh, speed hump suck. Huh? 
and uh, given that some of Joji's other designs, an E39 is going to become an all-time classic from the mark. It's no wonder the rest of his work is standing the test of time so well. Oh, just listen to that engine, that's glorious. This is a post-facelift car. The uh, facelift happened in April 1999. This is an August 99 built car, so it gets the new features like the uh, revised tail lights, and I think there's more chrome bits in the headlights as well. And under the skin, the M52 had risen from a, a 1.9 to a 2 litre, and I believe in this guy's makes 148 horsepower, 140 foot pound of torque, and that will throw this thing at the horizon in 0 to 60 time of 8 seconds. Which, okay, that's not earth shattering in itself, but for a small rear wheel drive sports car, that's actually quite respectable. And it's the kind of thing where you don't want too much power in a chassis like this because it's open top, it doesn't have that much rigidity. The, uh, the coupe version was 17% stronger. I've chosen the worst possible test route ever as it's ridiculously twisty and quite, quite steep and I can't see around the corners. The moment you start this car you hear that glorious BMW straight six, the M52 just starts to growl and it's a unique sound in motoring, it's one of those all time great engines, it's up there with the Alpha Busso V6 and the Jaguar XK engine, it's one of the all time, on the Rover V8 of course, it is an all time great in terms of power delivery and audio quality, it's, oh, it's magnificent. And the power delivery is just creamy. It's just a wonderful thing to be driving. Just from rest, the moment the power starts to pick up as you lift the clutch, it's almost electric the way it just is so seamlessly smooth. There's no, no shudder and no judder. It's how all engines should be. I'm gonna to apologize for the video quality because I can see the camera shaking and I think there's a problem with my mount. The car isn't actually shaky at all. It is very hard sprung. I'll give it that. It's a sports car suspension setup. Even though the tyre walls are really, really high. I didn't check what the profile is, but they are very tall tyres. Um, they are giving a certain amount of softness to the car. Now, as you accelerate, that straight six, it just buzzes and the revs rise smoothly, the acceleration it's very linear, there's no power curve, it's more like a straight line going up. And it's not breathtakingly fast. I say 0 to 60 in 8 seconds, but it just does it effortlessly and enjoyably. Now the chassis of this thing is quite an interesting combination. It's built on the E36 platform, so the 3 Series of the 1990s. I stand to be corrected here, I'm sure I'm going to be corrected. I believe it's the E36 compact platform and it actually uses the E30, the previous generation's trailing arms at the back. This actually makes the car feel really quite nimble and quite lithe on the road. But surprisingly, the car does feel quite heavy on the road. It obviously has power steering, power brakes, the brakes are extremely effective. And the steering, I say it is heavy, but it, it's not like an unassisted older car where it's hard work to make the thing move. It's just got feedback and resistance, so you, you know what the car's doing, which is actually quite welcome. But the car doesn't float around like it's an airy little thing. It feels like a substantial vehicle. And if you turn at speed, there's a lovely amount of resistance and feel in the steering wheel. You know, you really know what the car's doing. You can feel how the wheel is behaving on the suspension and against the road surface. I'd never given these cars much credit for being anything more than a poser's toy, but this is actually 
really quite good. And bizarrely, even though I'd had no time for the standard convertible in any, like, particularly the 1.9, which I thought was a gutless wonder, I really did like the Z3M, that bizarre clown shoe of a sport high performance car. That I thought looked awesome. I think there's more about me than the car industry at the time. But sitting here, the interior is beautifully made. It's typical 90s BMW. A nicely sized leather steering wheel feels very nice and tactile in your hands. And the gear shift is brilliant. The lever is exactly in the right place for you. And uh, even though the, uh, the lever is curiously chromed, I'm not sure I'd go for that option. I think it's an original M Sport part. The change is fabulous. You shove it through the gears and it just clicks into place. It's quite stiff, but the car's only got 15,000 miles on it, so it's barely even worn in. Oh, it's fantastic. Oh, it loves a corner. It really does give you incredible confidence that you can throw this car around and just have fun with it. And it's not gonna complain, it's gonna stick to the road. If it wasn't my car, I maybe would be pushing it to see if I could get the back end out a bit, because it's that lovely rear drive chassis that's just waiting to be played with. But it's not my car, so I'm not going to. Listen to that engine. That glorious straight six, it's fantastic. As I was saying, the interior, the dashboard is like a leather effect, hard rubbery plastic. No squeaks and rattles there. It feels really, really solid. Surprisingly, and in its favor, not only does it have a driver's airbag, it's got a passenger airbag in the dash as well, which is a real nice bonus. I think uh, it was a law to have a driver's one by 1999, but uh, I think passenger side was still optional at that point. And we still have the last vestiges of BMW's driver focused uh, central binnacle console thingy, we're gonna call this thing, in the middle. It is, in some ways, a reminder of a, an earlier time because the car was uh, pushing 10 years into its life cycle at this point, as there's not much going on. We've got the radio, which is now an aftermarket Sony. You've got your nice little chrome-ringed heating and ventilation dials. No air conditioning, we'll save that conversation for the comments. And an analog clock, which kind of fits in the same aesthetic. And then, of course, we just have a few blanked off buttons and an ASC button, which I guess is the traction control, which you can turn off should you wish to. Now being a convertible, obviously you'll have noticed there is no roof. That is actually electrically controllable with this button behind me, conveniently placed, I think you'll find. Oh, when I first got in the car, I just thought it these two bigger buttons behind me, but in fact they don't do that. They open uh, a couple of lockable cubby holes, which is quite practical because obviously being a convertible, you need your cubby holes to be lockable, otherwise your sunglasses and other accoutrements may go walkies when you park outside the yacht. The seats are quite comfortable. They're not as buckety and supportive as you might expect, but they are comfy, they are all leather, and they have this rather interesting, almost uh, ostrich leather effect in the center sections, which is actually carried on in the floor mats and the door cards. Nice theme going on there. There's two real themes of the car's character. One is solidity, because the car just feels really, really Germanically solid in a way that, I don't know, not everything does, even from Germany. And secondly, it feels capable. It feels like a, a proper manual gearbox, rear wheel drive sports car. Not all about out and out performance, but loads of grip and lots of fun. And I feel bad I didn't give this car the credit it deserves for so long. And now I'm driving one. I feel very, very sorry. I apologize for my actions in the past little BMW. You are much better than I ever thought you were, and I am sorry. This is strictly a two-seater. There's no pretending it's a two plus two that with a back seat you can't actually use. I'm miserable. Miserable bloke. There's a guy in a Z3, one of these, gave him a wave, didn't even look at me. It's not like that in minis, I'll tell you that. The switch gear has a lovely light, positive click to it which is nice, we see sort of roll up to a roundabout as I just have and just brush it up, lovely. 
my God, three BMW X3s in a row. That's three people with absolutely no taste whatsoever, all coming together in one place. It's a really ugly car, the X3. Sorry, BMW fans, but I don't like that car at all. This is a rant for another day, but I don't see the point of small SUVs. Especially not if they're ugly. Actually, one thing I've just noticed is missing from this BMW is the downward dangling eco meter, which they normally get in the uh, bottom of the speedo. There's a digital readout instead, very modern. I'm surprised because I think the, did the E39s have that at this time? I don't know, I have to find that out. Thanks for watching again. I hope you like this one. See, I said it would be different, didn't I? Not another Rover. I've no idea what the next one is going to be. That would smack of planning, and that's one thing that doesn't happen in Furious Towers. Planning. Yeah, we very much rock up in the morning and see what's available with keys in it.